Okay, today I want to talk about the future of transportation and especially the role of autonomous air taxis and the role of hydrogen fuel. And to do this, I am very pleased to say I'm joined by Brian Morrison, who is the co-founder of Alakai. Um, and Alakai is, is a developer of Sky, the world's first hydrogen powered zero emission air mobility vehicle. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Where are you joining us from today? So I'm, uh, I'm joining you from Hopkinton, Massachusetts, which is where uh, Alakai's original headquarters was. This happens to be my sunroom behind us. Um, and uh, Alakai is, is currently operating out of Minuteman Airfield up in Stowe, Massachusetts, about 20 miles north of here. And when Very I get in with you, I'll be headed up there to see how we're doing. Yes. So tell me a little bit more about the, 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 the company and, and what, you, what you're trying to do. Sure. So um, the earliest work on flying taxis was back in 2012 uh, when I first started doing some of the concept work. Um, filed the earliest patents in 2013 uh, and then really didn't really start looking for serious capital until 2017. Finally got funded in 2018 with our current investor and we've been working diligently to produce a a flying hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicle for certification uh, since then. Uh, we've had a couple of prototypes that we've built for different purposes. Uh, the first certification vehicle, um, subject to COVID, COVID delays, which everybody seems to be experiencing, uh, should be delivered to us uh, early October, middle October, and we'll put the fuel cell and the rest of the electronic packages in it expect to have that starting to do uh, certification testing under the FAA certification program uh, very late this year for certification of the propulsion package. Very good. So how, how, how does this, the, 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 the name of this vehicle is Sky, S-K-A-I. Um, how, how does it work? And maybe you can give us a, a little overview of, of what we're talking about here. Sure. So Sky is a um, five-person vehicle. It has a pilot seat located in the front center and then four passenger seats arranged behind it. The design of the vehicle was intended that it could be used for cargo, it could be used for med flight, could be used for um, air taxi operations, or could be used for flight seeing. And I mentioned flight seeing because the design of the side windows and the moonroof overhead is intended to give the passenger just a, a superb visual experience, whether they're flying through a city or flying along a coastline in Norway, looking out at fjords or, um, so it's intended from, the, from day one to be a multi-purpose vehicle. Uh, there are four uh, fuel cells on board. There are six motors and six rotors. Uh, we can lose any one of the motors um, <clears throat> due to damage or failure. We can lose any one of the fuel cells and still have the vehicle be controllable and be able to operate and land safely. Uh, flight control system is triple redundant. And on top of all that, there is an airframe parachute uh, that can be used in uh, ultimate emergency situations. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. So do you envisage that, 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 that this will have a pilot forever or do you see a future of autonomous vehicles? We, right now, today, we could fly it autonomously. The, the software exists. Um, from a certification standpoint, we're certifying it first with a pilot on board and for ground piloted operations, ground piloted, where the pilot sits in an office somewhere and has a tactical digital data link to the vehicle. He sees everything that he would see if he was sitting in the cockpit, but he can operate it from the ground. For some of the med flight applications, certainly for cargo applications, we think that will be a, a fairly significant use. The full autonomous operation um, really depends on the FAA and how long it takes to get to the point where they have regulations that they feel comfortable with and enough testing of the aircraft 
um, that they feel comfortable with certification. Um, I would guess that that's probably four or five years away before we get to a fully autonomous approved version. Uh, but there may be some um, baby steps along the way where fully autonomous operation will be allowed for offshore operations, for example, carrying cargo to oil rigs off in the Gulf, uh, or for carrying supplies to back and forth to hotels that are located on islands offshore. A little hard to predict, but there's a lot of things we can do under experimental approvals that will help the FA as well as ourselves um, gain actual real world experience in operating the vehicle that way. Yeah, this sounds fascinating. And the, the, the one bit I'm particularly excited about is that this is not only a, a flying taxi stroke cargo vehicle, but also is a zero emission vehicle using green hydrogen. Um, why did you pick that? Oh, it's, it's a rhetorical question, I guess, but what are the benefits of it? And, uh, and, and how does it compare to, to what's available today? Sure. So, as I said, I started this the concept work in 2012, 2013. Um, I spent hundreds of hours doing simulations, trying to come up with a lithium ion battery based solution that would give us enough energy to be a practical uh, transportation vehicle. And I say practical because under FAA guidelines, you have a certain amount of time that the vehicle can remain airborne. And then you also have to have emergency reserve that could be 15 or 20 minutes. So if you have a vehicle that's only got 20 minutes of battery life and you think you wanna have 15 minutes of operation, you don't have emergency reserve left to work with. Um, and you double the amount of batteries on board, you gain maybe two or three minutes of flight time because you've added so much mass to the vehicle for uh, a vertical lift vehicle. That's why you see some of the competitors in the battery space adding rotating wing bodies where they try and lift off and then rotate the wing to forward flight. That's a very complex operation and it's mechanically uh, complex. And I suspect that's gonna have some significant certification hurdles to overcome. Uh, we tried to keep the vehicle design simple. The use of hydrogen fuel cells goes back to, gosh, the Apollo uh, days uh, in the US space program. Uh, been used multiple times since then, much smaller fuel cells. Uh, but fuel cells are now starting to, to take hold in 18-wheel um, tractor-trailer trucking, in uh, rail service in Germany, um, in cars, uh, with most of the major automotive manufacturers now having some form of a fuel cell automobile. And that all helps grow out the infrastructure, the hydrogen uh, infrastructure for refueling. So looking at all that, I um, realized that we're using hydrogen fuel cells. The advantage we get is we can carry, say, 1,000 to 1,200 pounds payload, which is beyond the range of most of the battery VTOL uh, competitors. And then we can also stay airborne three to four hours on a tank of fuel, uh, whereas the battery-powered vehicles are looking at 15 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, and with a wing, you know, maybe 45 minutes. But nothing approaching what we can do with hydrogen fuel cells. Mm. So it's a combination of range, uh, payload, uh, and refueling time. We can refuel the vehicle in six to eight minutes. And I, I guess the, the the real challenge with making it a, a real green solution is making sure that this hydrogen is, is green hydrogen because we need a lot of energy mm -hmm. to create hydrogen um, and and therefore this energy needs to come from renewable sources, right? So right. how confident are you that we will be in a position to have this green hydrogen infrastructure in place? Well, green hydrogen is aspirational long term. Uh, we can operate off of like, today's available hydrogen sources, which hydrogen has been used here domestically in the States uh, for probably 50 or 60 years in, in various types of manufacturing operations. Um, some of it is created through a reforming process where they start from methane. That's not desirable because it produces carbon as a byproduct, but we can operate off of any hydrogen source no matter what. Um, the desire is we use hydrogen that's produced through electrolysis from water mm -hmm. and the electricity source would either be solar or wind or hydroelectric 
uh, or title. And what we're exhibiting uh, in an augmented reality demonstration over in, in Britain <coughs> will be a tidal generator located in the Thames that is generating electricity. Electricity is moved to shore where it's connected to an electrolysis unit that produces the hydrogen that's used to operate Sky as a vehicle in and around uh, London. Wow. So what 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 are the the near future use cases that you are seeing for Sky or for for any of, of those autonomous self-flying air taxis fueled by hydrogen hopefully so the, there's a significant amount of interest in uh, what i would call emergency response mm. um, we have a couple of state customers that are very interested in locating pre-locating um, sky vehicles in their various locations around the state and if they have a major hurricane that hits that closes off roadways um, number one they can operate sky in and around the area uh, much more cost effectively than using a turbine helicopter. Mm -hmm. And they can create their own hydrogen to refuel it. They're not dependent on the road, say like I-95, being available and open again to get fuel into a traditional helicopter. They can actually manufacture their own hydrogen using wind or solar sources that they can locate right there in the state. Um, so emergency response, getting people to and from a hospital, getting emergency rations or water out to people that are otherwise cut off um, is one big use that we see. And that can happen ahead of FAA certification. Um, the vehicles, if they're operated under the auspices of the National Guard, are exempt from FAA certification requirements. So we expect to, you know, mid to next, late next year, 2022, to having some vehicles that are operating in emergency response and potentially under autonomous operation uh, without a pilot on board that's very exciting um and the, and, the long, and, and, and the, the longer term use cases that you're seeing so we have a, a um, lot of intent with a customer um, in the air taxi market that initially is looking at a uh, fairly significant uh, production order uh, for early vehicles and then long-term uh, options for vehicles that could extend out to five or six billion dollars uh, in revenue. So we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. We've had some discussions with uh, major uh, freight operators, uh, folks like Amazon and Federal Express that are uh, looking at moving packages from point A to point B, very interested in autonomous operation as well. Uh, but near term, they're just looking to replace uh, existing aircraft that are costly to operate and that are polluting uh, through the, their operation. A lot of these companies are starting to focus on becoming zero carbon footprint in the next 10 years or so. So we're excited about those opportunities. MedFlight yeah. uh, certainly is an opportunity as well, mm. uh, where we can have you know a, a couple of uh, EMTs on board and a, a stretcher and medical equipment uh, fly to a location where there's, you know, been a, a road accident or just to a hospital where we need to transport a patient to another location. Very good. So what do you see as some of the key challenges that we need to overcome, maybe technically, maybe in terms of culture and and acceptability of, of what we're talking about here in terms of making this a, a mainstream part of future mobility? I think the uh, the vehicles will will make their own case for things like air taxi operations, where convenience and the carbon free footprint um, will sort of sell itself. Hmm. And as people start to experience taking an air taxi that is very very quiet and totally pollution free, that starts to open the door to, well, gee, you know, I flew in one of those. That was kind of cool. Maybe as the price comes down. You know, maybe a, several people get together and purchase one, or if a wealthy individual just buys one for their own use. Long term, we see them getting involved in not just air taxi operations, but commuters being able to live out in the suburbs or out in remote areas and have access to the inner city when they need to by taking a uh, clean, uh, carbon free vehicle to get them back and forth 
quickly, plainly. Um, but that's, you know, potentially eight or 10 years out in the future. Um, society is going to have to um, experience it, understand the safety uh, before they'll be adopting it on a large scale use. But I think air taxi and, and freight certainly will will be some of the early adopters that will help you get us there. And I'm guessing that there'll be some wealthy individuals in uh, the Middle East that may want one just as a, hey, this is the latest and greatest thing to, to get around in. And, you know, I want one for my personal use. And, so what price point are we talking about here? Um, I don't really want to get into um, pricing on it because it's so dependent on the fuel cells. And right now, most of these fuel cells that we're working with are hand built and the price is expected to come down by a factor of 10 on that over the next several years as we start to build volume. Long term goal is to be able to sell these vehicles for uh, 200,000, 250,000 or less um, if we can get to automotive scale production. And we are talking with a couple of automotive manufacturers about um, potentially building these on their production lines as automotive production starts to decline, they're looking for what's the next thing that we're going to be buying into or uh, that we want to be building. Uh, one of the big fallbacks or uh, failures in general aviation has always been um, general aviation aircraft are built a few at a time by hand, and they've never had the economies of scale to get the cost of the avionics down, to get the cost of the engines down, and get the cost of producing the aircraft down. And if we can get to the point where we're building 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 a year, we start to get into those economies of scale that will drive the cost down, uh, will help us get this into much broader acceptance in the in the consumer market, as well as just the business to business market. Very good. So what are your future prediction then? Let's say we're looking 10 years into the future. How would you describe the whole mobility landscape and, and what proportion of it do you see being autonomous and what proportion what mix do you see between air so three-dimensional and two-dimensional on on road travel well no there's a dangerous concept <laughs> to try and predict um i 10 years in the future i think um autonomous will be accepted although the degree of acceptance may still be in an evolving process, uh, but it will have been, you know, approved by the FAA in, in at least uh, targeted applications. Um, I think there will be a much greater acceptance of flying vehicles, um, air taxis, uh, freight delivery, um, whether it be with a ground piloted or in a fully autonomous operation. Um, autonomous is ultimately the way to go because you get the maximum payload with the, you know, without any impact in terms of having a pilot on board. Um, so for air taxi operations, that's the sort of the holy grail of how do we get the operating cost of the vehicle down as low as it can go. Very good. And and how how much of transportation do you think will be in three dimensions rather than two dimensions? Um. Are we talking in the United States or are we talking worldwide? Yeah, let's start with the United States, maybe. In the in the United States, it's it's going to be tough to overcome the, the Americans' love for their automobile um, until we get the cost of this vehicle down. So uh, 10, maybe 12%, something in that neighborhood in 10 years' time, uh, actually travel happening by that. At NASA and some of the very long-range forecasting has said, you know, in time, 40% of all travel will happen with autonomous air vehicles. Mm -hmm. But that may be more in the, you know, 10 to 15 year time frame before we start to approach those those levels. And do you, do you see any particular places around the world where there's more willingness to accept this? I, I know that, that places like Dubai are, are already trialing air yeah. taxi operations. I would say, you know, any place that there is uh, horrible inner city traffic. The business community will very quickly move to try and adopt, uh, at least have access to uh, clean, uh, advanced air mobility vehicle uh, capability. Um, so, you know, Dubai, London, 
uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, any place in, along the California coast, uh, Dallas, Texas, um, Sao Paulo down in Brazil, Singapore. Just look at, you know, what are the top 20 or 30 cities with the most congested traffic? Those are, are great markets to, uh, to start with. Very good. Thank you so much, Brian. That was a, a fascinating conversation, a super interesting concept. I, I love the idea of combining AI, autonomy, air taxis, and uh, clean green hydrogen. So I hope I, I hope. I wish you all the success with your your project and hopefully we'll talk again when we have uh, more of those vehicles in the air where we can actually see what they what they can do. We will look forward to it. Thank you Bernard. I appreciate okay. the time. Thank you so much. Thanks.